Knitting, like all crafting, is personal, and it ought to be. We put a lot of ourselves and our pride into those priceless pieces that we create with our own hands. And like anything that we pour a lot of pride and ourselves into, strong opinions are bound to be developed. And so for today's video, I will be sharing some of your spiciest knitting fiber arts related opinions, also known as your hot takes, and providing my commentary along the way, some of which I'm hoping will serve as that refreshing glass of milk to help wash away the burn. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Wool Needles Hands Midweek Ramble. My name is Taylor and I will be your host. And like I said in the beginning there, for today's video, we are going to be diving into knitting and fiber arts related hot takes. Your hot takes to be specific, as I recently set out to Instagram to ask folks over there to share with me their knitting or fiber arts related spicy opinions. And I asked for the spiciest of opinions and boy, did I receive some spicy hot takes around the knitting and fiber arts realm. Now, when you hear the term hot take, what that means simply is a controversial or what I like to say, spicy opinion about something in a particular realm. And in the case of today's video, we are sticking to the knitting and fiber arts realm. And at the end of this video, I'll be synthesizing everything we talked about here today and providing my final thoughts. Now, we're going to be diving into some topics here that may ruffle some feathers and may seem a little controversial in that there are lots of differing opinions. And just know, if your opinion differs from anything that I share here, that is absolutely okay. Part of being human and involved with other humans is the fact that you are free to have your own opinion. So please know that whatever my opinion is does not have to be your opinion, and that doesn't make your opinion any less valid. So know going forward, you're entitled to your opinions Absolutely. I also want to mention that I'm including some commentary here, not only to give my opinion about things, but also to provide you with a little bit further insight and in some cases, some additional resources that you can access to help give you a little bit more information about any of the particular topics that happen to pop up. If I tell you that there are additional resources linked down below in the description box, that's exactly what I mean. Head over to the description box and find those links there. However, if you happen to be watching this from a smart TV and you would like to have access to the links I mentioned here, you can scan the QR code that pops up on your screen now with your smartphone, and that will take you to the show notes links that are available over at woolneedleshands.com, the website associated with the channel. While you're over there, there are other things to check out in addition to the merch shop, which is a great place to pick up some swag for the Wool Needles Hands YouTube channel to help support your favorite Wool Needles Hands knitting podcaster. All right, everybody, if you are ready, I am ready. Gird your loins and let's get spicy. Hot take number one. Some people take the idea of pattern plagiarism too seriously. Patterns can look alike. Plagiarism as it relates to knitting patterns is a really murky topic to navigate because knitting patterns like crochet patterns and sewing patterns are instructional and direction based, kind of like a recipe, laying a claim of plagiarism is really quite difficult. However, that doesn't mean that issues won't arise between designers and if and when that happens, be prepared to handle that with the other designer respectfully and professionally. My response to this is that if you are a knitwear designer or you have plans on becoming a knitwear designer, do your due diligence before writing a pattern and publishing it to make sure that it is not something that was recently released in a very similar fashion with a design that is quite strikingly similar because that is where you could run into muddy waters. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are a plagiarist. It just means that there might be an issue that you need to navigate there with that other designer and coming at it from a place of calm, respect, and professionalism is absolutely important. Indie dyed yarn is fun to look at, but is too busy for a knit garment. First of all, indie yarn simply means yarn that is dyed by an independent yarn dyer operating as an independent business or artisan. Not all indie dyed yarn is variegated. And I think that what this person might mean here is that variegated yarn, though it is pretty to look at, can be too busy for garments. I believe that variegated yarn may be too busy for the preferences and sensibilities of some, but I feel like it may be just the ticket for others. Sharing patterns I've bought should be similar in law to sharing a book I've bought. 
I'm going to provide a little context here and I'm really making an assumption, but I'm going to assume that the person here is referring to a pattern that has been printed out. They purchased it, they printed it, and they have a physical copy in their hand, much like you would have if you went to a bookstore, purchased a physical copy of a book, have it in your hands, and you're going to lend it to somebody to read after you have enjoyed it. Sharing a printed physical copy of a knitting pattern with a friend or a family member after you have used it, I don't believe is a problem. However, I think the problem arises when those physical copies are copied and handed out to many different people so they don't have to go and purchase the pattern. And I would like to think that my example here is kind of like a knitting class with several people sitting around a table where the knitting instructor prints out a copy of a paid for pattern and passes it out to all of the people sitting in the knitting class. To me, I feel like that can be a little bit of a problem because if that continues to happen and if that is seen as acceptable then that is potential revenue that the designer loses because something is being copied and handed out. There is a legality to that. However, sharing a physical copy of a printed pattern that you have printed and knit from with a family member is really not an issue. And I also would go so far as to say if you wanted to share a pattern with your mom or a friend or something like that and you photocopied it and you gave it to them and you had a copy and they had a copy, I really don't think there's a problem with that. Another way that this could be a problem is if a person is making a copy of a pattern and profiting from that pattern, selling that pattern, obviously that's not acceptable. I actually found a really interesting Reddit thread that discusses this very thing and I'm gonna link to that down below so you can dive down that rabbit hole a little bit and read some of the opinions from other knitters in the community and see if that helps to kind of shape your own opinion or even if you're just curious to know what other people think about that particular issue. You don't have to knit garments like sweaters to be a knitter. I 100% agree. Not a lot to say there. You 100% do not have to knit sweaters or garments to be considered a knitter. Not at all. A yarn stash is only too big if you can't store it properly. I received a lot regarding the size of a yarn stash, and I will tell you, if you've got the trunk for the junk, embrace the junk in your trunk. You do you. It doesn't matter what size your yarn stash is. If you personally don't like to keep a large yarn stash, great. If you like to have lots of yarn around you and you find that's inspiring, fantastic. Live your best life, you do you, and the size of your stash is nobody else's business but your own. Having a baby slash adult version of the same pattern. Put them in one PDF, don't wanna buy two. I feel like knitwear designers, like any business, can do what works for them and makes the most sense and justifies any extra work that may or may not go into enhancing a pattern with multiple versions. If they wanna charge more, they can. If consumers don't like it, they don't have to buy the pattern. Knitting is more expensive than crochet so many different needle combinations necessary. Okay, so this was really difficult for me to like give a hot take on. I feel like if I had to, um, okay, so let's just say if we're focusing on yarn alone and you, you pair away everything else, we're just talking about yarn. So the same yarn um, for two different projects that are of the same type. So we have two cardigan sweaters. We're using X yarn for this sweater and X yarn for this sweater. The yardage or meterage requirements for these two projects are going to be vastly different because crochet requires so much more yarn to complete the same dimensions. So if these two projects are being knit to the exact same size, you're going to need more yarn for the crochet version than you are for the knitting version. And that is just from as far as I know, that's pretty much fact. So that means just based on yarn alone, it's going to be more expensive. Now, when you factor in things like tools and, and you know pattern prices and yarn and what crocheters typically use or whatever, I think that it can become really subjective and it really just depends on the maker. I feel like, and this would just be coming from an assumption, I feel like knitting is less expensive, generally speaking, than crochet, but I really don't know. And I think it really depends on how that particular maker spends their money, what they spend it on, and how often they're spending it on said thing. So it really is just, it's kind of subjective unless we put it into a vacuum and we have everything like standard. I don't know. Part of me thinks that crochet would be more expensive, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Drop your opinions down below, but that's my hot take on that hot take. I, I just don't know. Cheap cotton yarns suck. Lily sugar and cream is the worst. I don't know if I would say it's the worst. I feel like poorly made yarn in general sucks. Do I think that Lily Sugar and Cream is poorly made yarn? I mean, if you compare it to other nicer cotton yarns, then yeah, you could say that maybe it's 
poorly made in comparison. The thing is, is that Lily Sugar and Cream Yarn is intended for certain types of things. Things that are functional, things that are like kids toys or amigurumi, but it's not necessarily intended for your really lovely cotton garment. So if you're thinking that you're going to be using Lily Sugar and Cream for a garment that's supposed to look nice for any particular length of time and withstand lots of washing before looking faded, then yeah, Lily Sugar and Cream is really not going to get the job done. But for what Lily and Sugar and Cream is made for, for the target audience of that particular product, I think it holds up pretty well. So I do not think that Lily Sugar and Cream is the worst. I think that for things like washcloths, I think it's fantastic. And I think a lot of people would agree that there are a lot of things that you can use Lily Sugar and Cream uh, for that make it a perfectly suitable, if not preferable, cotton yarn. Cotton is to wool as gluten-free bread is to sourdough, and I'm allergic to wool and sourdough. Yeah, I completely agree, and so is linen and bamboo and viscose and rayon and nylon and hemp and tensile. All of these things are perfectly suitable options and alternatives to using wool yarn. And that goes for acrylic and synthetic yarn as well. I heard that I'm a newbie because I don't have an overwhelming yarn stash. Okay, well, I've heard that it's only newbies that call others newbies. Podcasters who feel like they have to have brand new or the best of in order to keep viewers. We're there to see you, not your new sh**. Inspire me with your knits. I have, I have commentary on that. Now, I can't speak for all knitting content creators or content creators in the craft world in general, but I will speak for myself. And I will tell you that momentum in terms of creative momentum and knitting momentum is not always consistent. And consistency is key to building a YouTube channel that reaches people. Finding other ways to inspire folks with knitting content outside of our own knitting project progress is really important to maintain that consistency and reach our target audience with information and videos and content that will inspire them to create. And it's not about views all the time, though views absolutely help to get our content out to new folks. A lot of times it's about the desire to be consistent. Bottom line here, manage your expectations of your knitting content creators. They are human and have lives and are doing their best to provide you with consistent and inspiring knitting content while also trying to maintain their own creative inspiration and fulfillment and maintaining their capacity for creating content. Color work yokes are overrated. They're more for the insta pick than the actual fit and style. I think that the eye-catching look of a color work sweater and the vibe that it evokes and the way that we feel when we see a really gorgeous Scandinavian style or fair isle or just a stranded color work sweater. I really feel that all of that came first. The Instapix came after because we realized that these gorgeous and striking knitting projects are going to get the clicks. And what gets the clicks is what wins. And we all know how social media works. If you have something pretty that you created, like a color work sweater, you're going to want to share it. And stranded color work yoke sweaters are absolutely no exception. Do I feel like they're great for Instagram posts? Absolutely, it's going to get the clicks every single time. Do I think that people are are gonna go through all of the work to create a color work yoke just to take an Instagram photo? No. There's a lot of work involved in that and I think that the Instagram photo and the opportunity to share is icing on the cake, but I don't think that it's the whole cake. In terms of fit, a lot of those fit issues that people experience from color work yoke sweaters has a lot to do with tension. If your tension is too tight, that color work section is going to feel very compressed on you and ultimately uncomfortable. It's important to remember that when you go to knitting a color work section on a a stranded color work garment of any kind, that color work section should be knit using a needle one size larger, if not two sizes larger, depending on your gauge, so that it can loosen it up a little so you don't have that compression effect. And so all of those different strands of yarn don't pucker up against one another. Acrylic yarn equals highly flammable plastic trash, trash can emoji. Okay. <laughs> Is it flammable? Yes. Acrylic is made from a flammable substance that is derived from polypropylene plastic. Is it plastic? Yeah, it's derived from plastic. Is it trash? That depends on the context and where you happen to be finding it. Is it lying at the bottom of a wastebasket? Then yeah, clearly it's trash. Is it in the hands of a person who is using it to create something special for themselves or for someone else, which in the context of today's video, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Then no, it is clearly not trash, nor should that person be made to feel that it is. I can't in good conscience buy any yarn without having a plan for it or a pattern 
in mind. My brother was once told by a judge during a jury duty stint in regards to a really complicated verdict, do not do violence to your conscience. And I thought that that was really good advice. And I feel like that could be good advice here as well. Pattern testers should be paid or at least have a little more incentive to work. Okay, so in my opinion and in my experience, pattern testing is a kind of volunteer work. You get to keep the product, you get the pattern early and for free, and you have a direct line to the designer if you have questions or issues. If testers want payment, they are absolutely welcome to seek out pattern designers that are offering payment. A lot of crafters are snobs about yarn and tools. Now this um, theme of snobbery and craft snob and yarn snob really was one that popped up a lot. And these are my thoughts on snobbery as it relates to making and crafting and in this particular case, knitting or crochet. Snobbery exists when people behave in a way that makes it obvious to others around them that they perceive themselves to be better or superior to those around them. Using the fanciest and most expensive yarn and tools is a perfectly acceptable option for knitters and they are free to make that choice. It only becomes Become snobbery when those same knitters are making others feel less than for choosing differently. Let's stop using the term snob when we're referring to folks who like nice things. It's just rude and unnecessary. Pieced garments fit better. Now what that re is referring to here is that garments that are knit in pieces and then seamed together. Now I can't personally speak to this because I have yet to knit a garment that is pieced together, but from what I have heard from other knitwear designers and knitters who knit primarily only pieced garments, that this is absolutely true, that the seams help to hold the garment together and give it structure, causing it to last longer because it doesn't sag over time, leading to something that just really fits better for the long haul. Like a lot of things, your mileage may vary. Variegated yarn is almost always matronly and overly busy. It can be. I think that it depends on the project and the colors within the variegation. However, I do have some examples of variegated yarn projects that are absolutely not matronly. good at knitting or crochet doesn't automatically mean you should sell patterns. Yeah, I mean, being good at something doesn't mean that you should automatically turn it into a business. However, if your goal is to make a business out of designing patterns, then it's really important to make sure that your patterns are up to snuff. Do the work to create a quality product. Knowing how to knit or crochet doesn't mean that you know how to write a knitting or a crochet pattern, so have it tested and edited by somebody else. Being a knitwear designer should not be just around the one person who conjures up the idea for a design. There should be a team of people working together there to ensure that the design works and that people are going to be happy with a pattern that they are paying money for upfront without having access to the pattern. Imagine it like this. You you have a team of four people. The designer is the brains of the operation. The tech editors seek out the mistakes and iron out all the wrinkles on top of doing all of the math to help grade the pattern. And in some cases, the pattern grader is actually a whole nother person altogether. Pattern testers are there for quality control. And there's usually not just one pattern tester. Lots of people will volunteer to test a pattern. And then finally, there's a photographer. And that photographer might actually be the knitwear designer. But one way or another, there's going to need to be a person that can help turn that creative design into a captivating visual. In my opinion, the best knitwear designers out there right now have all of that on lock. I don't want to monetize everything I make out of yarn. I just want to make things because I enjoy it. Amen. I hear you. You should not feel that you need to monetize your creativity. That is absolutely not something you should feel compelled to do if it is not something you are already motivated to do on your own. And the pressure is real. I mean, we can't possibly use or need 25 sweaters and 48 hats or 67 pairs of socks. And so when we accumulate all of these different pieces, we start to wonder, what should I be doing with this? Should I be selling the pieces, selling the patterns? How can I make this work for 
me and we always will think in the very back of our mind, how can I make this profitable for me and my family? Whatever you decide to do, and if that means that you do decide to monetize, there's nothing wrong with that. Just know that if you are turning a hobby into your work, you begin to strip away a little bit of that freewheeling joy you had with that hobby to begin with. And a little bit of that is pretty normal. Just be extra cautious and only monetize if you feel that you can fit the monetization into the joyful aspect of the hobby so that it continues to make you happy through and through. Being size inclusive is more than just grading for 13 chest sizes. If size inclusivity means including and representing every size and shape possible, then yeah, 13 bust sizes is not enough. However, I find that expecting every size and shape to be represented and included in a single knitting pattern is a big ask and one that may not always be feasible. I believe it's very important for knitting or crochet patterns to feel accessible to people of all shapes and sizes. And so I posit that rather than placing so much emphasis on asking designers to grade their patterns for some arbitrary number of sizes and shapes, we should be asking the knowledgeable to teach us how to do the math to grade the pattern ourselves. This way we have access to every pattern regardless of our size or shape. You can give a knitter a pattern in their size and they have that pattern in their size. Or you can teach a knitter to grade a pattern for themselves so that they can accommodate their own size and shape and they will have access to nearly every knitting pattern available. I have provided resources in the description box that teach you how to grade knitting patterns so that you are empowered to do all of that on your own and you will no longer have to worry about whether or not a pattern you want to knit will have sizes that fit your body. Knitting socks is fun at times but seeing them break after wearing three times sucks. Yeah, you know, I can really relate to that. And that's why I feel like we should never stop knitting socks. And it's really hard when you absolutely lose your knitting mojo. People are knitting socks all the time because you go through socks quite frequently. This is why our ancestors were knitting socks around the clock. When you get into sock knitting, it's important to manage your expectations and not think that those socks are going to be with you as heirloom pieces, you know, for a lifetime because you're going to be wearing them and walking around in them. And it's just natural that they are going to have holes or tear and they're just not going to hold up. So just plan on knitting socks around the clock if you always want to have hand knit socks to wear. It's okay to just buy your sweaters. Yes, absolutely. You are free to go out and buy your sweaters. Just because you begin knitting doesn't mean that you can no longer purchase things that you could otherwise knit yourself. Putting that kind of pressure on yourself is really unfair and can lead to a lot of stress and burnout. Just, you know, absolutely do not do it. If you see a really great sweater in the shop that you want to have and you love and it feels good on your body and you love the, the fabric, whatever, and you can afford it, whatever, all of those things, I empower you or I give you permission if you even need it to purchase that sweater. And I feel like being a knitter of garments allows you to appreciate, you know, construction of store-bought sweaters, the fiber content of a store-bought sweater. It just gives you a little bit more insight and almost makes you a little bit more of a knowledgeable sweater shopper. So yeah, you can absolutely buy that sweater. Everyone should try becoming a maker, just like kids are encouraged to play sports. I could not agree with this particular one more. I think that there is so much value in that statement. I think that the benefits of making and creating are absolutely undervalued. We as a species are creative. We are, we, we have evolved because of our creativity and what we are able to do with our hands and our minds. And I think that we need to embrace the creative side of things for all of the benefits that we can reap from doing that. And if you don't believe me, create something today and you'll see what I mean. You can thank me later. There is no point in brioche knitting. Just use fisherman's rib. There are at least two points in brioche knitting. Your needle points. <laughs> As a larger knitter, we got to acknowledge that not all sweater styles work on all body types. Yes, 100%. And not just as it relates to larger knitters, just knitters of all kinds of shapes. Your body shape really has a lot more to do with how a sweater is going to look on you than your size. You can be, you know, very, very large in size and have the same body shape as somebody who is smaller than you and similar 
sweaters will look similar on you because of your body shape. I think that size plays a role, absolutely, but I don't think it's the role that, I don't think size is playing that role. I think that um, it's important to know what sorts of sweaters look good on your body shape. What is the shape of your upper body? Um, but yeah, I, I think that's absolutely a big one. There are certain sweaters that I don't think look great on my particular shoulder situation and i know that a lot of people have those qualms as well i have provided some resources down below that you can check out to give you a little bit of insight into what sorts of sweater styles look good on what sorts of body types and that is actually a video i will be coming out with this fall um, so you can look forward to that but in the meantime definitely check out those resources if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how to choose the right sweater style for your body shape and size a lot of indie dyers are overrated. This is something I've heard before and not just about indie dyers, about designers, about yarn brands in general. And I think that this really stems from a place of preference. And it kind of happens when your preferences kind of um, deviate from the preferences of what would seem like a majority because you notice that so many people love something that you really just don't love and it makes it seem overrated. And that's exactly what it is. In your opinion, it is overrated. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a preference thing. I would just say that this means that for the most part, the indie dyers that you like or um, that maybe you don't like are liked by so many others. So we all have our own opinions about things that are overrated. That is a very subjective and personal thing. Um, but surely, surely this person is not referring to fiber for the people. Just, you know, putting that out there. Knit gifts for loved ones in yarn that is replaceable so they actually use the gift. I... I'm, I'm picking up what this person is putting down. I understand what they're saying here. I think that it's really your choice what you knit these gifts out of, but I would be really cautious to overemphasize with the recipient how expensive the yarn was or how fancy the yarn is or how much work you put into something because I feel like that will create a sense of unease that will be really difficult for the recipient to disassociate from that particular item. Now, if you give this item to said person and there is a noticeable lack of appreciation or understanding or acknowledgement for the work that went into creating this, you, you can just remember that um, and file that away in your file of people to knit for or not to knit for in the future. And you do not need to let this person know of their status in that file. Unless, of course, this person has done something completely heinous and mean to you or has broken your heart, you can absolutely alert them to where they stand in your people to knit for file. A project does not count as finished until it's blocked with the ends woven in. In the words of Walter White. We're done when I say we're done. Why knit a style you can buy at H&M? I don't get it. Crafting is for extraordinary stuff. Maybe so you don't have to buy it from H&M. And crafting is not reserved for extraordinary stuff. Crafting makes the stuff extraordinary. More lingerie, please, especially with mixed fibers and textures. They look great on anyone. Um, funny. I feel quite the opposite, thank you. Knitting lace or cables is not hard. You just need to be more focused. Yeah, that's why it's hard. Sorry, but I'm never going to block a swatch. No apology necessary. There is no point to short sleeve sweaters. Yes, but what about this one? We are all unique in our opinions, perceptions, and sensibilities. We all have different ways of doing things and lifestyles and priorities that shape our crafting behavior. And how and why we craft is really up to us. If someone doesn't like what you do and they choose to tell you so, and, and these people exist and you will encounter them, just smile and nod and carry on down your path. And embrace the fact that for every person who feels compelled to tell you that what you're doing is wrong, there are several people in your corner that appreciate and are inspired by the creative goodness you're putting out into the world. Empower your crafting by focusing some of that creative energy on individualizing patterns and projects to work for you. Learn to design and improvise. Learn to grade patterns to fit your unique size and shape. Learn to correct your mistakes. If we expect these things from ourselves, we find that we become 
become more proud of the work that we create and we rely a little less on others to do some of that work for us. Live and, and let live. Do no harm, but take no shit. Make what you love and what brings you joy because when you do that, you inspire others to do the same. Build up your skill set and revel in your creations. Don't monetize what you love unless you can continue to love what you're monetizing. And to quote a knitter on Instagram who provided one of the hot takes for today's video, be the chaos gremlin you wish to see in the world. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me today as I shared some of these hot takes on my own commentary. And thank you for dealing with the sun going behind a cloud. Thank God for clouds, it's been so hot here. So I know that the lighting has been shifting, but I appreciate you coming all the way through with me. This has been a good time. I like providing commentary on hot takes like this, and I really hope that it does help to shed a little bit of light on some of these issues and give you a little bit of a different perspective. Please check the description box below for additional resources on some of the things that I talked about here. Thank you so much. If you took value from today's video or enjoyed yourself at any point, please don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Definitely subscribe and click that bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload new content here on the channel, which is every Wednesday and every Sunday. And until I see you again on Sunday's episode of The Knitting Podcast, happy knitting, happy making, happy whatever it is that you're doing. Take care, be well, and I will see you soon. Bye.